Uh, welcome to Physics 163. Um, <clears throat> my name is Armin Rahmani. I'm the instructor for the course. And uh, this is the first time we're doing these classes online. So basically, the, the course is through Canvas. And I'll be posting these lecture videos on Canvas, roughly four uh, lectures a week. So I'll, I'll go over kind of the the material, maybe work out some examples. Um, I'll be using both like some slides from the publisher that also contains some uh, conceptual kind of ABCD questions. So I'll ask you sometimes to pause the video, work on some problem or something like that. And also I'll, I'll use Microsoft OneNote um, to write things and that serves as, as a blackboard. Um, so because we can't kind of directly interact uh, during these videos, the, the office hours are really important in this class. Um, I encourage you to, to try to come to the office hours. Of course, they're, they're all online through Zoom. So on the syllabus, you will find information about, you know, how to log in. So there's going to be a link that, that you can click on and, and get into the office hours. Um, the fixed times are Mondays between 9 and 10 a.m., Wednesdays between 10 and 11, and Fridays between 2 and 3 p.m. Um, if you need help with something else, you know, just send me an email and we try to find, find the time. Um, so we, we have some other Zoom chat. Um, so then We'll be using the, the same textbook as Physics 161 and, and 162. So it's a textbook by night that, uh, that you're used to. And all homework is through Master in Physics, which is, again, the publisher's online tool for homework that, that goes with the textbook. Um, I'm planning to have maybe two midterm exams and a final. So we'll probably do the, the midterms as, as a Canvas quiz. And the final will be a take-home exam that you write your solution and submit it electronically. Um, we're still kind of working on the labs, trying to finalize the structure. Uh, most likely, the labs will be on the scheduled time, so as if you know we had uh, in-person classes. So each of you have registered for a particular section of the labs and the idea is that there will be zoom meetings with the tas uh, during those times so you will be hearing from the lab uh, coordinator about about the labs the idea is to kind of replace the actual experimentation either with simulations or a video where you see the experiment being done and you can collect the data or you're provided with the data and you analyze it or or something like that. So the, the labs are still being worked on, and um, but that's the idea. The, the, the general idea seems to be that you will attend the labs online at the at the specific times. Unlike, unlike classes where you can watch these lectures anytime you want at your convenience, and you can rewind or pause or watch parts of it again, or if you're watching again, maybe you can fast forward. Um, so, so let's uh, talk a little bit about the material. So, as I said, this is a continuation of Physics 161 and 162. So in 161, you learned a lot about mechanics. You learned about motion, forces, um, energy, acceleration, dynamics. Um, and 162 was focused on electromagnetism. So you learned about charges and the interaction between charged particles, electric field, magnetic fields, circuits. Um, 163, so if we, let me share my, my screen here. Uh, just, yeah. So let's talk about kind of, and give you an overview of what we will be doing um, in this course. So physics 163, 3. Um, so we start uh, the course with chapter 12 of the, of the book. It's on rigid body 
rotation. So this is at some level like leftover material from mechanics. I mean, it, it is, we study mechanics, we study dynamics of extended rigid objects. So we're kind of moving away from point particles, which was the focus of, of 161s, one to objects that have some shape and size, uh, but they're, they're not flexible. They're, they don't change their shape. And then, so an object like that, you can think about its motion in terms of translation and, and rotation. So we, we talk about kind of the analogs of linear motion uh, for rotation and talk about kind of how, how to deal with, with these objects. Um, the, the, the chapter kind of generally or naturally connects to, to what comes next, which is chapter 15 on oscillations. So rotational motion is, is periodic motion. As you go around, let's say, a circle, after you go full circle, you come back to your initial point and then you kind of repeat uh, that motion. Similarly, oscillations are, are periodic, right? You move back and forth and you come back to your original position after one full cycle. And there is actually a connection between rotation and oscillation. So oscillations can be viewed as kind of the projection of rotation on a particular axis. So there is a natural thread that connects uh, the study of rotation to, to oscillations. And then we move on to oscillatory phenomena. So we talk about like in what circumstances oscillatory motion arises and also talk about the mathematics of describing oscillatory phenomena. And we, we will do that both in, in the context of mechanics like a pendulum or a mass connected to spring or something like that, or in the context of electromagnetism. So there are some electric circuits, for example, that exhibit um, oscillations. Oscillation phenomena are quite ubiquitous in nature. So anytime you have kind of an equilibrium position, you perturb a little bit away from that, that stable equilibrium position, it's quite generic that you kind of start oscillating around that equilibrium position. So it's a, it's a very important and, and fundamental uh, topic in physics. And then from oscillations, uh, we move on to, to waves. So oscillations have to do with periodic motion as a function of time in kind of one point in space. Waves have to do with these oscillations that are extended uh, in space. So you're familiar with maybe water waves, right? Waves that propagate on the surface of water. There are waves in, in strings, for example, in musical instruments, um, maybe a piano or a guitar string. Again, there are waves along, along the string that, that create sound. Sound itself is a wave. It's, it's waves of pressure in the air uh, that propagates and then you know, it hits our eardrum the eardrum oscillates somehow, some signal is generated, go, goes to the brain, and we hear things. Um, light is a source of, is a, is a kind of electromagnetic wave. Um, and so that's how we see. Um, and all kind of uh, telecommunication is based on electromagnetic waves. Again, a very kind of ubiquitous general type of phenomena that occur in many different contexts. In, in more advanced topics, like in quantum mechanics, again, we have mathematical objects, something known as the wave function, um, which tells us about the probability of finding a particle in, in a place. Uh, there are also like gravitational waves. So recently, a Nobel Prize was awarded to, to the observation of gravitational waves, which was predicted by the general theory of relativity. So we won't be talking about these more advanced topics, but we study the general kind of physics and mathematics of, of waves. Um, and that's, that's quite important in various areas of, of science. So, so we move from chapter 12 to chapter 15 and then continue. So there are two chapters on waves, um, chapter 16 on traveling waves and chapter 17 on superposition. So it's the idea of kind of adding two wave patterns together and getting other other types of waves. So we will talk about those things. So 
let's see, so chapter 16 and 17 are on waves. And then we, we talk about optics, so the physics of light. So as I mentioned, light can be described as, as electromagnetic wave. So then we jump again all the way to chapter 33 um, on wave optics. So we talk about properties of light that, that originate from its wave-like nature. So we talk about, for example, interference and diffraction uh, and, and things like that. So then finally, we talk about a model of, of light that's valid in, in a certain limit, but it's quite useful in analyzing lenses and mirrors and things like that. It's known as the ray model or ray optics. Optics. Uh, where basically we can imagine light as kind of rays that come out of a source and go, go along kind of straight lines. So that's the general outline of this course. As you can see, there are uh, five kind of different topics. Uh, one contains two chapters, and the other ones each one chapter. Chapter 12 is a bit longer than the other chapters, but that's, that's roughly the structure of the course, and we have kind of nine weeks to go through these uh, six chapters. So on average, each chapter will take a bit more than a week. Again, some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. So, um, so let's start maybe with, um, with chapter 12 on rigid body rotation. All right. So, all right, so that's a preview of what's in this chapter. So the first thing is we, we try to gain some intuition about what we mean by a rigid body and try to kind of uh, make that more precise. We talk about torque, which is kind of the analog of force in the context of rotation. And, and also when we talk about rigid body, there, there's, a, there's a quantity known as the moment of inertia, which is kind of the analog of the mass. So we will be talking about these various quantities, how to calculate them, how to relate them. Um, torque causes kind of angular acceler acceleration, kind of an accelerating rotational motion. So we talk about kind of the analog of Newton's second law in the context of rotation. We talk about angular momentum, which is the analog of momentum. So it's kind of quite a bit of generalizing what we learned about mechanics um, in the context of linear motion to, to rotational motion. All right. So first, let's try to discuss, you know, what we mean by, by a rigid body, which is kind of a central object in, in this chapter. So we, we'll, we kind of have some intuition about what a rigid body is, right? If something, like if you have Play-Doh and it can easily change its shape, it's not rigid. A rigid object is something that doesn't change its, its shape, like a, a pen, a piece of chalk, uh, a plate, any object that does not change its shape that much. It doesn't, you know, when you try to bend it or you compress it or you stretch it, everything, of course, you know, responds a little bit, but those, those changes in distances are much smaller than the actual size of the object. So for example, um, 
you know, you can't imagine like a glass of water, right? So the glass itself is a rigid object, um, and the water inside is a liquid. It's not rigid. If you move it around, if you stir it, it changes its shape. So the whole combined system is not rigid, but the glass itself is rigid. So if you want to like, try to come up with some definition of what we mean by rigid, is that the distances between different points of an object um, do not change. If you put a point on, on an object that's rigid, it has a shape that's not changing, um, then then the distance between this point and some other point you put on this object wouldn't change. So consider, let's say, consider, I don't know, a disk. Let's pretend that's a circle. Uh, let me put like some point here, call it point A, and another point here, call it point B. Right, so imagine like you take a coin and with a marker you just put two marks on, on that coin. Then no matter how you move this coin, you throw it up in the air, you move it around, you rotate it, uh, the distance between these two, that's fixed, right? Unless, you know, the shape of, of the coin is changing. So, so that's kind of our mathematical definition of a rigid object. We can approximately assume that the distance between all the points on this object do not change. And that, that has to do with both kind of the outside and the internal structure. So if, you, if, for example, you have a can of soup, right from the outside, it looks that the shape is not changing, but you know that there's some liquid inside and some pieces of potato, etc. So inside, things can move if you shake the can. So that's not a rigid object. Both externally and internally, all the different bits and pieces of this object, they're, they're stuck in place. They have a fixed distance from everything else inside that object. So that's the... That's kind of the class of objects whose dynamics we want to study, right? It's, it's a way of going from a point particle to an extended object, but it's a very kind of constrained kind of system of many particles. Um, and it turns out that it's much less complex to study than, for example, fluid. All right. So you gain some intuition about what a rigid object is. And as I said, when generally kind of a rigid object moves, uh, this motion has two, two modes. So you can, let, let's take a look at this figure here, right? So it's a rod. A rod is a, a rigid rod. It doesn't change its shape. All the distances are fixed. And we can take it and just move it without like changing um, the direction of the rod. So all the points on this rod kind of move along a straight line, and those lines are all parallel. So this is like pure translation. Right? Uh, you can think about rotation as you kind of fix maybe the center of the rod, and you just rotate the rod around that center. So maybe you drill a hole through the center, put a pivot, and let it kind of rotate around that axis. And in general, like if you throw a, a rod in the air, what it does is it kind of does both, right? The gen general motion um, has both translation and, and rotation in it. All right. So the next thing we want to talk about is kind of the kinematics of, of rotational motion. So it's helpful to review a little bit kind of just the kinematics of linear motion, especially motion with constant linear acceleration. So that's something you've seen a lot in 
in 161, but it's, it's quite helpful uh, before getting into rotational kinematics to, to review linear uh, kinematics because the math is really similar and we can kind of make these connections. So, so let's say review of linear kinematics. All right, so if you think about a point particle that's constrained to move along a line, a one-dimensional line, so let's say 1D motion of a point particle. So let's say that's the particle, P, and it's constrained to be on this line. So we can pick maybe a, a an arbitrary point on that line and call it the origin O. And then at any instance in time, if we kind of take a picture of this particle, it's going to be somewhere on that line, right? So we would know that the full configuration of the system, consisting of this point particle that's constrained to move on the line, by knowing the distance x between where the particle is and the origin. So just one number x kind of fully gives us where the particle is. If x is positive, it's to the right of the origin. If x is negative, it's to the left of the origin. And we would know at every instant in time, if we know the value of x, we know where the particle is. And of course, x, if the particle is moving on that line, can change as a function of time. So let's say this is t, this is x. And the particle is doing something, right? It's moving around somehow. So x of t is, is the full configuration of this particle. So a, a natural question is how fast the particle is moving, right? So we can talk about, um, at a given point in time, how fast is it moving? What is the rate of change of x, right, with respect to time? And, well, so let's say this is time t here, and that's x of t. And then you can imagine a little bit later, let's say, we imagine an infinitesimal tiny amount of time, we call it dt has passed, and the particle is now at x of t plus dt. All right. So the displacement, how much the particle has moved in that time interval, is just x of t plus dt minus x of t. Then we define the velocity as the ratio of dx to dt when, when dt becomes smaller and smaller. So that's kind of really the, the slope of the line that's tangent to this curve at that point. And mathematically, you know, it's the derivative of x of t. If we know x of t is a function of time, then velocity v is just a derivative of that function. So as an example, let's say if x of t is alpha maybe t cubed plus beta t, if the position is changing like that as a function of time, then we can readily find the velocity as a function of time by taking one derivative. So the derivative of t cubed is 
three times t to the three minus one, right? So the derivative of an exponent, like t to some exponent is the exponent times t to that exponent minus one. So this gives me three alpha t squared plus beta. The derivative of t with respect to t is just one. So that's an example where we, if we know the functional dependence of position on time, we can find the, the dependence of, of velocity on time. All right. We can play this, a similar game in the same way that we thought about the rate of change of position as a function of time. We can think of the rate of change of the velocity itself as a function of time, and that gave us the acceleration. So again, you have velocity at some point is vt, and a little bit later, it's v of t plus dt. So that's a change in velocity, and the acceleration is defined as the change in velocity over the duration of the time interval where that change occurred uh, in the limit that, that the time interval is really short. So, <clears throat> so that's the, the acceleration. So in 161, we focused a lot on motion with constant acceleration. So let's review the kinematics for constant acceleration, namely the case where acceleration, the case where A itself does not change as a function of time. So let's say this is T, this is A, and A has some fixed value, does not change as a function of time. So in this case, we kind of found a few important kinematic equations. So the first one was, what is the velocity as a function of time if the acceleration is constant? Well, we know that the derivative of the velocity is fixed, so the velocity must have a linear dependence on, on time, and the slope is, is just the value of the acceleration. So it's going to look something like this. So v of t in this case, when the acceleration is constant, becomes the value of the velocity at time t equals 0 plus a times t. Right, if you take the derivative of that, we find it's a. The derivative of v naught with respect to t is 0. The derivative of a t with respect to t is a. So so the derivative is just a, that works. And then similarly, we found the position now as a function of time to be the initial value plus v naught t plus 1 half a t squared. And we can see that if I take the derivative of, of this expression for x with respect to time, Well, x naught is a constant, its derivative is 0. The derivative of t with respect to t is 1, so the derivative of this term here is v naught. t squared, when, when I take the derivative, gives me 2t. So 2 cancels the 1 half, and I find a t, and that's exactly the expression I had above. So we have these two important equations, the dependence of velocity and position, on time for a particle moving in one dimension with fixed acceleration. There is another important kinematic equation, uh, which is not independent from these two, but basically if I solve for t from the first equation and just insert it into the second equation and simplify that, I can find an equation that does not have explicit dependence on t but relates to velocities and positions. So that equation is v squared minus v naught squared is 2a x minus x naught. 
So that's the third important kinematic equation for, for the case of constant acceleration. Now, so that was just a review. Now let's think about um, rotational motion. So let's say rotation around fixed axis. <clears throat> so if you have, let's say, some pivot point here, and you have an object or a point particle, let's say, that's rotating around this, well, the distance between the rotating point and the pivot will remain constant. So, so the point will be on a circle whose center is is the pivot point. So let me clean up my circle a little bit here. All right. So we, we pretend that's a circle. So every point on this circle has same distance r from the center. All right, so then remember when we were talking about a point particle moving on a line, right? We said we can, if I take a picture of that particle at every instant in time, I know exactly where it is if I specify the length x. So when, when we're moving on a circle, um, let me just pick some some direction. It's kind of common to pick a horizontal direction. And then if at any point in time I specify the angle between that fixed direction and the line connecting the center of the circle to where the particle is, that angle fully specifies the, the position of the particle, right? So I have this is my circle. This is that fixed line. So if I know theta, I just start from here and I move kind of counterclockwise by an angle theta. And then I get some point here and then I draw this line from center through that. There is only one point on the circle at that angle. So if I know theta, I know where the particle is, and then we play the same game. Right? Theta encodes the configuration of my system. It fully characterizes where the particle is. So as a function of time, again, if I know theta for every, every given time, I, I know how my particle is moving. We can ask exactly the same question as before. So it's really a mapping between x and theta. And then velocity v was the rate of change of x. We can define something known as the angular velocity. So let's consider this table here. So linear rotational. Theta plays the role of x. And omega, which we define as the rate of change of theta with respect to time, uh, plays the role of velocity. It's known as angular velocity. So let's say again, we, we can do the same thing at some given time. We know that theta is theta of t. A little bit later, at t plus dt, we know that theta is theta of t plus dt, 
and how much theta has changed is dt, which is defined as theta, is d theta, which is defined as uh, theta of t plus dt minus um, theta t, and omega is just the rate of change of theta, which is that d theta, the amount theta has changed divided by the duration of that tiny, tiny interval. We can keep going, right? We can play the same game. Now think about the rate of change of omega. So in the same way that the acceleration was the rate of change of v, we can think about now omega is a function of time. And what is the rate of change of omega as a function of time? Well, call it alpha. And that's known as angular acceleration. So, if I want to write the kinematic equations for these things, for the case of constant angular acceleration, so kinematics with constant alpha, again, I find that omega is omega naught its initial value plus alpha t. So the derivative of this omega with respect to t is alpha. And then I find that theta, it's its initial value, plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. And then the analog of the third equation, which, which we get from eliminating t between these two is that omega squared minus omega naught squared is 2 alpha theta minus theta naught. All right. So that's a summary of the kinematics for motion with constant, um, constant angular acceleration. <clears throat> so this slide really characterizes what we went through in, in some detail. So angular velocity is just the rate of change of theta with respect to time. Angular acceleration is the rate of change of omega with respect to time. Uh, one important observation is that if you have a rigid body, um, all points on this rigid body have the same angular acceleration and angular velocity. So you have a rigid body rotating around the fixed axis, right? So let's go back um, to our whiteboard here. So let's say angular velocity for fixed axis. All right. So consider some kind of a rigid body, rigid object. Say this is the axis of rotation. It's rotating around this this fixed axis that's coming out of the plane. And okay, so if I consider two different points on this, so let's say I have a point A and a point B. So at a given time, I look at this thing, and point A is maybe making an angle theta a, point b is making an angle theta b with, a, with my fixed line, 
that I picked. So <clears throat> the axis is a point on this rigid object. A is a point on this rigid object. B is a point on this rigid object. And when an object is rigid, the distances between different points on that object do not change as the object moves. So let's call that point P, for example. So if you consider the line um, from P to A, it has some length that doesn't change as, as the object moves. The line from P to B similarly doesn't change as the object moves. And furthermore, the line from A to B doesn't change as the object moves, right? So, so if a little bit later, you know, let me just focus on this triangle that's formed by A, B, and P. A little bit later, let's say, A moves by, by some angle, so some amount is added to, to theta A. Theta A becomes like theta A plus D theta A, and some other amount is added to the angle for, for B. Well, if this is the same triangle, right, it's like that whole triangle is rotating. So, so geometrically, there is no way, if all the distances are fixed, for d theta a to be different than d theta b. So as this object, as this rigid object is rotating around the fixed axis, uh, the change in theta for various points on the object is the same. Therefore, uh, so we find geometrically that d theta a is the same as d theta b. And that means that omega a, which is d theta a over dt, is equal to omega b, which is d theta b over dt. So this rigid object, because it's rigid, because none of the distances change as the object is moving, has only one angular velocity, right, at any given time. There is only one angular velocity for this entire object, meaning that every single point belonging to this object uh, has exactly the same angular velocity. And therefore, angular acceleration, which is just the rate of change of omega, will be the same. So a rigid object rotating around fixed around the fixed axis has one omega and alpha for every point uh, belonging to the object. That's just a consequence of all the distances between all points being the same. All right. So, yeah, so we discussed this point. We've reviewed these kinematic equations. So, the notation is a little bit different from what I wrote on the, on the board. So we call the initial values omega naught, theta naught, etc. And b theta, delta theta is just theta final minus initial, and the final value we just call them omega theta and omega. So 
we need to think a little bit about the sign of these quantities. So there is a widely used convention saying that the counterclockwise direction for rotation of motion is positive. Okay, so if you know, let's say you have an initial counterclockwise angular velocity and the disk as it's rotating around its center is speeding up, so let's say the magnitude of omega is going up, well, you have a positive omega because it's in the counterclockwise rotation. Uh, direction and you have a positive acceleration because this counterclockwise number is going up. This is a different case where omega is clockwise, so it's rotating this way. So omega is negative, right? It's speeding up, so the absolute value of omega is getting larger. So for example, initially it's maybe minus one, then becomes minus two, right? It's going faster, but you have a negative number that's going down, right? So the difference between final omega and initial omega will be negative. The change in omega is negative as time moves on, so that gives you a negative acceleration here. Similarly, if you're moving clockwise, omega is negative, but you're slowing down, then, for example, initially you're minus 2, and then you become, let's say, minus 1. The change is plus 1, so you have a positive change in, in angular velocity, and then the angular acceleration is positive. And finally, we have the case of counterclockwise slowing down, positive value going down, um, which gives us a negative acceleration. All right. So I'll let you think a little bit about this question so you can pause the video and read through the question. All right. So let's come back and look at it together. So you have two coins that rotate on a turntable, and coin B is twice as far from the axis as coin A, right? So which of these is correct. So the angular velocity of A is twice as that of B. The angular velocity of A equals that of B. The angular velocity of A is half of that of B. Well, we talked about angular velocity for all the points on a rigid object being the same, right? So if you have these two coins on, on our disk, and they're not moving relative to the disk, they're just rotating with the disk, they, they have the same distance there, they can be viewed as parts of this rigid object, and, uh, and they all have the same angular velocity. All right, so that's uh, probably a good place to stop. Um, yeah, so next time we will keep talking about uh, various aspects of, of rotational motion, and we try to find other kind of analogs of, of linear motion. Thanks.